want you to set aside time to pray. And let the Spirit of God work through you. I want you to set aside time and say, Lord, I'm going to fast. Maybe it's going to be from a meal, a few meals. Maybe it's going to be from entertainment. Maybe it's going to be a hobby. Maybe it's, God hasn't laid it on my heart. And, uh, but maybe you want to fast for, from sleep for a while and say, Lord, you're more important to me than any of this. And this week, take time to pray. And we've been trying to do this the first full week of every month in 2015. I believe God is blessing it. This, this month, being the first of, of the year, across the Assemblies of God, they're calling for prayer around the world during this week. So we won't be alone in this. And I want us to pray and believe. And the Bible says, one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. If not only all of us in this church begin to really pray and seek God and do some spiritual warfare on our knees and we join with the saints around the world, I believe we can change the world in one week. Amen? Amen. So join with us as we have that time of prayer and uh, set that aside. You know what else I did? I left my sermon notes in my office. <laughs> Oh, happy New Year. Well, would the ushers come and prepare to receive the gifts of tithe and offering? <clears throat> and our text in the sound booth caught my hint because they've got a second set of notes back there. Bless you. Thank you, Dennis. We're going to make our offering proclamation together. I sow my finances in the kingdom of God. The gospel will be preached in all the world. Lives will be set free, and the kingdom of Satan will be stopped. It will produce for God and for me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I count as done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. No, no, it's, we're good. Sometimes we, we need a receipt. I better make sure all the pages are here. Those one your rascals might have shorted my bed or something. There we go. And this morning, as God is giving me back my voice, we're going to be taking a look at authenticity. Authenticity. I want you to think about that word. There it is. Let's try it again. There we go. Oh, I can move. Cool. I felt that too. Authenticity. I want us to, to really grab a hold. What does authenticity mean to you? I mean, what does it mean when something is authentic? And what's the opposite of authentic? Fake. Fake. Fraudulent. A ripoff. How many of you would like to buy something you thought was authentic for a lot of money and find out that it wasn't authentic in, at all? That, that feeling that comes over you when you realize, I've been duped, I've been had, I've been taken advantage of. This morning we're going to take a look at authenticity. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, says, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge, in all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That authenticity. Father, this morning, I pray that as we begin 2016, <laughs> Father, help us to be willing to look into our own lives and look for authenticity. And Father, anything that is a fraud, anything that is not authentic, 
Lord, I pray that, that it will be gone and we will demonstrate with clarity what it is to be a child of the Most High Living God. Lord, I thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Authenticity. Authenticity is a noun. It is the quality of being authentic. It's pretty deep, isn't it? <laughs> the, uh, the quality of being authentic. Genuineness. That's authenticity. Authenticity concerns the truthfulness of origins, attributes, commitments, sincerity, devotion, and intentions. Authenticity or authentic may refer to having passed the test. Passing the test. Having an expert come in and look at your painting or look at the coin or look at the stamp and say, this is an authentic when it passes that test. The world's view of authentic was kind of interesting. I, I looked this up. It's an existential, existentialism, I'll get that word out. In, in, in existential, existentialism, I gotta say it slowly. Authenticity is the degree to which one is true to one's own personality, spirit, or character. Despite external pressure, the conscious self is seen as coming to terms with being in a material world and with encountering external forces, pressures, and influences which are very different from and other than itself. A lack of authenticity is considered in existentialism to be bad faith. Now this is a line of thought that pretty much becomes a religion in ex existentialism and where they say authenticity is the core of what they believe. But let me tell you something, if people that are, that are worshiping themselves recognize that authenticity is important for the world to see, how much more important is it for the world to see authenticity in our lives? As I continue to look at what the world thinks of authenticity, I, how many, have you ever heard of TED Talks? Anybody? A few of us. TED Talks. Uh, I guess the best way to describe it is an expert comes in in a field and gets up and speaks with, uh, more, it's more of a contemporary uh, address and it's a kind of a blog that they do. But I found a TED talk about authenticity uh, by a doctor, Maria Sirios, and she stated, in living our life, an authentic life, we have the ability to thrive. That sounded pretty good. If I live my life authentically, if I, if I as a born-again Christian, allow Jesus Christ to be so real in my life that I am authentic, I have the ability to thrive. But she goes on and explains what she means by saying, when you start to live someone else's life, you begin to feel unalive. Sup at your own table. Now this is what she's telling everybody. Sup at your own table. Drink from your own well. Speak from your own heart. Follow where your own path leads. For anyone that hopes to lead you cannot help but to lead you astray. You stop and look at that, that's the biggest bunch of gobbledygook you ever heard. It sounds wonderful, but sup at your own table. 
I don't know about you, but I don't have much to put on my own table. It's kind of like saying, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. I'm sorry, when I'm laying on my back <laughs> and I grab a hold of my bootstrap, I don't even have boots, so I don't know. But I can't pull myself up. And if I go to sit down at the table of my heart and say, let me feed myself something nutritious and good and wonderful, I have nothing without Jesus Christ. So when she says, sup at your own table, drink from your own well, I, I could date for years and never strike water. She says, speak from your own heart. The Bible says that the heart is a terrible, nasty thing. And when, when we just have that in us and we don't have the power of God and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You ever found that to be true? Yeah. Whew. She says, follow where your own path leads. How many of you could say, that's kind of circular? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm a little bit different. And I recognized it, I, I, I recognized it when, when my mother passed away, my dad was just kind of lost, you know, and, and uh, I, it kind of confused me, but then I started thinking about it. Uh, there have been times when, when uh, Tish has planned a trip to go somewhere, when the kids were little, I remember she wanted to go visit her parents and I couldn't get the time off, so I said, well, just go ahead and go, that'll be fine, and she packed the kids up and Boy, I, I was excited. I had a whole bunch of things I was going to get done. I, I, man, when she got back, it was going to be incredible the amount of things I was going to accomplish. And she left, and I'd start working on something over here, and I'd get sidetracked, and I'd start working on this, and then I'd go over, <coughs> and then the television was on, and I was watching that. That's me. Yeah, and, and but I was in circles because it was... I just got thrown out of balance. All by myself, alone. Let me tell you, I'm a mess. Yeah. And, and this lady's telling me, follow where your own path leads. I, we've got a neighbor who's got horses. He's got an old horse that's gone blind. He doesn't want to put him down, so he, he feeds the horse and takes care of the horse. But that horse, so it doesn't run into anything, it walks a lot of times just in a circle. And if you watch after a while, that, that horse will wear a path out. And so often I feel like if I didn't have Jesus Christ to lead me, I'd be making a circle myself. And this lady's saying, Take, uh, follow where your own path leads. Now listen to this. This is what the world is, is really starting to grab a hold of in, in this new age that we're living in. For anyone that hopes to lead you cannot help but lead you astray. The world believes that authenticity is being transparent, displaying who you are. But the true Christian believes that authenticity is being transparent, displaying who Christ is inside of you. That's the difference. Authenticity to the world says, show them what you're made of. <laughs> Authenticity to the Christian says, show them who Jesus is. And we in the kingdom of God need that authenticity, that transparency. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. I don't live anymore. When I found Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I surrendered my life, my living, my time, my purpose, my desires. I surrendered them. To, you want to know where a lot of our problems come from in our lives? It's when we don't surrender all of those things to him. And we got to be, I got to be me. And then one day we're like Frank Sinatra and we said, I did it my way. My way. And that's a wide highway. 
that leads where we don't want to go. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I remember a song that said, it is Christ living with, within me. My, my grandmother, she got me to sing songs that, uh, that were out of my genre. Now Barbara's working on me. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, she, she brought me this song, and it, it, this song was, was this, this scripture. It says, and the, it is Christ living within me, and the life I now live is a reflection of him and his glory and his love and his power. That's what that transparency is. That's what authenticity is. The life which I now live in, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's authenticity. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real. Look at your neighbor and say, real. There you go. Still more and more in real knowledge in all discernment. How many of you have known folks that they said they fell in love with somebody but you knew they really didn't know them? Hmm? I remember it was really bad, really bad in, in high school. Some guy would come in and he said, oh, I love her. <laughs> A week later he's talking bad about her because she's Made eyes at some other boy. We think we, we love someone, but we don't really know them. But he says, this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. Not just in this, this fantasy love, this just, just ooky gooky stuff. But he says, in real knowledge and all discernment. Knowing what it is to really love so that you may prove the things that are excellent. You talk about authentic, excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You, you talk about authenticity. That's what this is talking about. As a matter of fact, where it says, in order that in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, I looked up that word sincere. The original word is a compound of two words to make up what sincere is. The first word is the splendor of the sun. How many of you know yesterday was a good day for, for sunshine? We haven't had a lot of those lately. Been a little overcast. But that bright sun. Uh, how many of you are like me and you, you, you need bigger font when you read things? And you, you get one of those prescription bottles <clears throat> and you're trying to read it. Are you like me and you go over to the window? I mean, you can get in these lights, and you, but you go over to the window and the sun shines. When the sun shines, you've got a better chance. There's a brightness there. There's a clarity there. And when it says the, the splendor of the sun is part of that original word sincere. The other compound word is I judge. So what that means is the things that can be examined in the clearest and strongest light. So when he says, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, that, that, I, that we live lives that, that can be examined under the clearest and strongest light. No shadow. Nothing covering us, no bushel over our light, but a clarity that comes out. Philippians 1, 9 again says, And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. True Christians believe that authenticity is transparency displaying who Christ is inside of each one of us. That's why it's important to have the right thing inside of you. 
the right thing inside. You ever heard somebody say, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones? I remember as a kid thinking, well, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Where, where would you put the bathroom? <laughs> I'd be hiding. <laughs> there are things that we don't want other people to see. Why would we want a glass house? But as we, as we look at this, that transparency, there, we have to live a life where we can tell people, follow me. That's what Paul said. He made, he made four great statements. He started off by saying, follow me. And I remember as a teenager reading that and thinking, Fo follow me. What, you're you're kind of arrogant there, Paul. But then I began reading more about Paul and studying what he said. And he was taking, that was his first step when, when he wanted to, to bring someone to Christ. He, his, his philosophy along that line was, follow me. And I remember, in the hollering you hear, Bob's playing a part for the children's church, and he really gets into his part, so don't worry, nobody's hurt. But uh, uh, when, when, when I was in juvenile court, the judge that I had, I had the greatest judge in the world, bar none. Ron Dvorak, just incredible guy. He hired me. He didn't tell me this, but I know he hired me because I was a pastor to be a juvenile probation officer. He hired me because he knew that I would be praying for his kids that were in juvenile court. As a matter of fact, one day he came to me and he said, Man, I haven't seen you in court for a while. Your kids aren't getting in trouble. What are you doing? And I smiled at him and I said, I'm praying for him, Judge. And he smiled back and said, I know. And went on. And I, I, in that juvenile court system, I was so appreciative of that opportunity and being able to work with a judge like that. I did not want to damage him or get him into a bind because of anything I said. So I didn't have a Bible on my desk. I didn't wear a cross around my neck. I lived Jesus Christ everywhere I went and everything I did. Now, did I mess up? Yeah. But God is able to overcome my failures. And I remember specifically a day when a young man looked at me and he said, he said, you know me, you know my family. He said, what do I have to do to have a better life? And I stopped and thought, his family was a mess. His parents made decisions that were so destructive. He didn't have any direction to turn. And I looked at him. I looked him right in the eye and I said, Bud, you watch me. You see what I do and you do what I do. And I promise you, your life will be better. And at that moment, it really struck me what Paul was saying. Follow me. Because the next statement he made was, follow me as I follow Christ. You see how that works? He's saying, he's saying you're follow, follow me. Come on, follow me. Here we go. Come on. We're following. Here, okay, good. You're following me. Now, follow me as I follow Christ. You see how he's starting to put a reference on that? And later on, we read where Paul, Paul says, follow me and Christ. And he's bringing them up, and he says, and then he makes a statement where he says, follow Christ. And if we do that correctly, if we are living a transparent life, when we reach out to a lost and dying world, and we bring them to Christ that way, by the time they get to the point where we can say, follow Christ, they are ready to look at someone else and say, hey, follow me. But far too often, we just say, hey, come on, you need Jesus, follow him. And we don't live that life before them. Far too often, well, not too many years ago, there was a song out on the Christian radio station. Any of you have songs that come on and you turn the radio off? I got a few of them. <laughs> One of them says, says uh, don't look at me if you're looking for perfection. Don't look at me, I'll only let you down. And I, I hear that song and I think, man, you wimp. You're not even trying. You're just saying, don't look at me and I, I don't 
tell you what Christ is. I don't show you Christ at all. What kind of statement is that for the body of Christ to make? We need God wants authentic to place before this world. That authenticity that causes us, <clears throat> excuse me, to pour out of the kingdom of God into the lives of the people around us. They want a realness. They want to see something that really works. That's why it's so important for us to have the right thing inside of us. Verse 11 of Philippians chapter 1 says, Having been filled with the fruit of righteousness. If you're filled with that, then transparency says you're just, it's, they're just looking in and seeing the, the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And that's why Paul wrote to Philemon, I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which, which, with which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of everything which is in you for Christ's sake. Everything that is in you. If we're going to be transparent, if we're going to be authentic, then we got to have the real goods within us. The Bible says that, that we are just earthen vessels holding this treasure that's within inside us. This mystery that the world wants to know about. Have you ever been to, to a mystery dinner theater or something? And the mystery's going on and you ooh, who did it? You know, I, I remember when I was a kid growing up, I used to love Perry Mason. What did Ta-da, ta-da. And then the theme da 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 yeah. But uh, I bet Perry Mason, they'd, they'd bring in a character, and I'd think, oh, I bet you this guy did it. And then they'd go a little farther, oh, no, he couldn't have done it. He's got an alibi. I bet you this guy did it. And by the end of the, you know, the last 15 minutes, the whole family's saying, oh, I think it's this guy. No, it's this guy. And we've all got who we think it is. And then the winner is whoever's right at the end. And you solve the mystery. And you want to know why that show was so widely popular? It's because the world loves a good mystery. And they want to solve that mystery. They want to have the answer to the mystery. And we have this mystery within us. The mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we're born again, we are filled with these good things the gospel puts into us. Philippians 1.9 again says... And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. So why is it that we have such a tough time being transparent? Why is it that we have such a, a difficult time being so authentic? What is it that, that's inside of us that we really don't want anyone else to see? And why is it that we're afraid to be real? Fellas, if you just put on some soft music back there, is it possible that we're not sure that we are real? Do we really have what's real in us? What does it take to be real, to be transparent, to be authentic? I don't know if I've used this in a sermon before, but I've used it in a few funeral services about some great saints. for people trying to figure out what it means to be real. <clears throat> There's a child's book, one that I really like, called The Velveteen Rabbit. It does a remarkable job of explaining what real is. 
talks about this nursery room and the different toys that are there. And we all know as children, toys come and go. But there are a few toys that last and make it the distance. There was a velveteen rabbit that was brought into the nursery. It was new. And it had made a relationship with this old skin horse. And they had a conversation one day about what real is. It says, what is real? Asked the rabbit one day. Does it mean having things that buzz inside of you and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time. Not just to play with, but real loves you. Then you become real. Does it happen all at once? Like being wound up? He asked. Or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges, or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off. And your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all. Because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. Real is something you become in Jesus Christ. It doesn't happen to you like that. It's a process. As the Lord does the work in you. That's why the Bible says that when we elect board members, we're not to get someone that's a novice because they need to grow some more. It also says for that we're not to, to choose someone that's given to wine. Doesn't control their home. We've got to, we've got to work through those things and let the, the power of the Spirit of God do that work within us. And then we can be transparent. We've got to stop making our own decisions and start asking the Lord, what do you think? What would you like me to do in this situation? The fact is, you can be real. You can be authentic through the grace of God. Paul spoke of some weaknesses that he had <clears throat> that he would have loved to cover up and not talked about and been inauthentic about. When he talked about that thorn in the flesh, he explains that we can be transparent and authentic even with our weaknesses present. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. How many of you can say, I got a lot of powerful perspective here? <laughs> I, I got plenty of opportunity. I remember I got the weirdest look from an older preacher one time. I told him, I got, I got more potential than anybody. There was a room full of pastors, and somebody got pastors. I said, I got more potential than anybody else in this room. He looked at me, what? I said, yeah. In my weakness, he's made strong. He's got all kinds of opportunity with me. I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of broken pieces and parts that, that just don't fit right and all these things, but God uses them. He works through them.
to accomplish. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Paul goes on here and says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. None of us likes to talk about our failures. We like to talk about our successes. <clears throat> but when we're willing to be transparent and say, you know what? <clears throat> I don't have a clue what to do in this situation. Something I've been saying a lot lately is, I don't have that tool in my toolbox. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that giftedness. I need help in this area. And I've found when I get with the brothers and sisters of Christ and tell them, I need your help because this is something that I am not able to do. All of a sudden, I find it gets done better than if I'd have just acted like I knew what I was doing and pushed my way through and seen what happened. I will boast all the more about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insult, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, that's the key, if we're going through them just because of our own decisions, we didn't ask him, and we're going through it on our own strength, if we're following our own path, and we're supping at our own table, then those things that come because we've made mistakes are ours to carry. But when we give it all to Christ, when it's for Christ's sake, it says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. My question to you this morning is, are you authentic? And do you want to be authentic? I almost said, do you want to be authentic? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to be more authentic? The authenticity of Jesus Christ in you. One of my, I, I've, I've mentioned it before, one of my great hopes is that of all the tools that God has in his artist box to make this beautiful masterpiece of our lives. He's got hammers and chisels. He, he's got paint brushes. He, he's got all different kind of tools for what he's building and what he's making this huge piece of art. But I'd ask God, if it's possible, I would love to be that tool that he signs his name with. That's all. To know that I was held in the hand of the master and used to authenticate his masterpiece. And today I believe God wants to authenticate us by helping us to say old things. What I did yesterday when no one was looking has got to be passed away.
today. I just want us to have an altar where we're at. I know sometimes we come down front, sometimes we gather together, sometimes we stand. But this morning, right where you are, with no one moving, I want you to make an altar right there where you're at. And if you're ready for authenticity, then I want you to just tell God that you surrender. No terms. You just surrender. And he will be in charge of your life from this moment on. And you will not turn back <clears throat> to the sins that you're leaving behind. Father, I thank you that the blood of Christ has been supplied so that we can be washed pure as the driven snow. I thank you that you don't want us to be conformed to this world, but you want us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Father, I pray that we would be transformed, that we would be then transparent as you've poured the gifts of the Spirit inside of us and the fruit of the Spirit that will grow from us and others will partake of. Now, Holy Spirit, have your way in each one of our hearts and lives. Help us to be an authentic masterpiece created by you. Lord, let us be completely yours, I pray. Now, Father, I speak a blessing upon each one here today. The blessing of authenticity. That people will see Jesus Christ in them and through them. I speak the blessing of authenticity and the power of your spirit moving in their lives. I speak the blessing of authenticity, of being completely honest about their strengths, knowing that that's where you become the strongest in their lives. Lord, I speak the blessing of living an authentic life that demonstrates the life-changing power of the blood of Christ that a lost and dying world will see what true authenticity is in your eyes. Now, Father, may this message be cemented into our lives. And may we determine to set our faces like flint to press toward the mark, to finish this race, not only to finish it, but to finish it well. To be able to say, I have fought a good fight. And to one day hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, I speak that blessing in Jesus' name, and I count it as done. Thank you now, Father. We give you all the glory and praise. And everyone that received that today said,